I'm better. Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, and then get ready to flip the page to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. While you're doing that, uh, we began this year telling you about some church-wide goals, one of which was uh, a modest remodeling and debt reduction plan. And I want to give you a little bit of an update. Uh, it's progressing. If you come in, you'll see signs and uh, the puzzle out front, and we're about 80% of the way there. So we're doing very well. I'm very, I'm very pleased to see that. Um, we had a delay in the summer because the contractor that we were originally going to work with um, I don't know exactly what happened. We had the delay. Anybody ever do construction? Does it ever go as quickly as you want it to go? It does not, and so it is with us. But the good news is that uh, last week, week and a half, uh, the, uh, the approval was given for a plan, and uh, in the beginning of December, the foyer and the church is going to look a little bit different. Uh, we are going to uh, remodel the bathrooms, and I don't think the ladies need any more explanation of why we think that's important or necessary. Uh, we're also going to try to create some more space in the foyer to better facilitate uh, our guests and other things we want to do in the future. And so out there, that limestone wall that I'm looking at, which you cannot see, uh, is going to go away. And the walls that make Joyce, our office manager's <clears throat> office, those are going to go away, and we're going to recapture that space for foyer. And then we're going to, we're going to pick the colors, make sure it, it, it lines up well with, uh, with our vision and that sort of thing. But that should be happening after Thanksgiving. So we're moving along, and I'm, I'm pleased to see that. Um, I'd like to invite you to prayerfully consider to, uh, to, to above and beyond your normal giving, to, to push forward so that we can uh, give to this project and uh, finish it up by the end of the calendar year. I, I don't like loose ends. That's just my own type A coming out there. But it'd be really awesome. So we're 80% of the way there. Um, please pray about your participation. Some of you are giving on a regular basis towards it. Thank you. Some of you thought about it but didn't jump in. Hey, why don't you think about jumping back in? Uh, some of you have already given all that you, want to, all that you can give or you thought to give. Uh, pray about God giving you some more resources to do that. Let's get it done. All right. Um, would you please stand out of respect to God's word? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. And then Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Another um, Another verse on faith. Uh, I'll start with verse 1. Let us run with endurance the race God has given us, have set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. This is God's word. Let's get rolling. I love it. I love it. When God uses words like confidence and assurance and endurance, when describing the work, his work in the lives of his people, I just think it's awesome. And today we're going to begin a four week series on the doctrine of faith. The Bible says that there are three values or three things that will endure through eternity, faith, hope, and love. And it goes in that order for a good reason. Faith leads to a person having hope. You ever try to live without hope? Or maybe you're living right now where you don't have much hope. I'm excited because I'm going to talk about faith, which will lead to hope. And when you have hope, you can move forward to love God and to love others. It's a very simple process. Faith leads to hope, leads to love. And so this series is coming straight from, from my heart, from my heart to you. I've been doing, I've been in ministry for 25 years. I had to count it up, and I, I ran out of fingers and toes 25 years. And 
I've seen people struggle with confusion, with guilt, even pain over the topic of faith. And so it's my desire, my hope for this series is I want us to explore what the Bible teaches about faith, about where it comes from, what it's based on, and how a Christ follower lives by faith. And so faith is not this like bad internet connection. You ever like tried to be on the internet with your phone or at home you got cable or some kind of DSL and it's like it comes and it goes and it comes and it goes. You know, faith from the Bible is not something like that where it comes and goes. Saving faith and sustaining faith is a gift from the Almighty God who does not change. So the very core about what we're going to talk about is based on who God is, not how you're feeling or what your circumstances, because there's so much stuff in our lives that's so unpredictable, it's up and down. Would you agree with me? And so faith is anchored in something that's unchanging, something that's solid and stable. It's based on God. And so um, in this day and age, people use the word faith, and I'm just going to do some preliminary stuff. Some people think faith is like a form of spirituality, like that guy's got faith. That guy's a person of faith. But here's the problem with that. Um, To have faith, you have to put your faith in something to be a person of faith. Well, the Bible says that you can put your faith in the wrong things. You can be a faithful person and be faithfully wrong. Some people think that faith is some kind of like religious optimism, like, hey, something good's going to happen. I just know it. And I understand what they're saying when, when they say that. But I don't want people to have the misinterpretation of faith as like, all right, then because I have faith, it's automatically going to lead to health or wealth. Because sometimes you can be faithful to God, and God will lead you into a season of suffering. Read the rest of Romans chapter 11, where we started off with, especially the end, and you'll see what I'm getting at. Still others think that faith requires uh, someone's brain to be turned off. It's like, all right, I'm a person of faith. I just leap without facts. And God is not like that at all. I mean, God put that thing between your ears called your brain to use it. And so, for example, in the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, God is speaking to a faithless people, the people of Israel. And in Isaiah 1, verse 18, he says, Come, let us reason together. Let's use your brain because you're faithless. Let's use your brain so I can help rebuild faith in you. Or in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Christ's followers are told to offer an unbeliever, a person who does not have faith, at least not yet, the reason for the hope that they have. These are all thinking words. Offer that reason of hope and and gentleness and, and respect. So when you come into the church, or as you head into the world that you live in and you live out your faith, which we're going to talk about more in the upcoming weeks, uh, you're gonna, your brain is going to be required. And faith that's not grounded in facts is like unicorns or something. You know, it's just a superstition. But guys, Christianity is not based on superstition. It is grounded in facts. And finally, sometimes people think that uh, faith is like an emotion, that it's something that we work, uh, uh, work up. Now, in two, three weeks... I'm going to talk about how we work out our faith, but the Bible does not teach us to work up our faith, like a guy trying to, uh, you know, keep a a tire inflated. So faith to him is like, okay, I got this tire that's continually deflating, so I just got to, I just, how's it going? Oh, man, I'm just trying to be faithful. I'm just trying to be faithful. And there's this perspiration just running down the guy's face and exhaustion. Building up. Do you, have you ever seen that? Uh, I, a few years back, I remember a friend who was, who was just all tied up in knots because he seemed to be torturing himself because he felt like he did not have enough faith to bring healing prayer to a family member. Oh, 
God forbid that someone has to live like that. We don't want to have air pump faith. No, what's faith? Faith is based on the stability, the power, and the trustworthiness of God. Faith is grounded on the stability, the power, the trustworthiness of God. Faith is believe in a God who can be trusted. And as your faith is in this God, so builds hope. And from that hope, in his trustworthiness, God will lead you to take action. And so, for example, you know, in your program, we have the faith promise cards. Faith. What's up with that? Well, at our church, we believe in cross-cultural evangelization. So we, we, we outreach to our community. We seek to impact the world, and we do it through the faith promise, where from our anticipated sources, our unanticipated sources, we give above and beyond towards cross-cultural evangelization. When someone takes one of these cards and begins to pray over it, and then they begin by faith to write out what they believe God wants them to give, they're putting their faith in a God who is stable, a God who guides and provides. And so this is an action of something that God is doing in someone's heart. The bottom line is that your faith is, faith is based on a God who is good, a God who can be trusted, who does not want to bring harm to you, but only what's good. Now, I got in my pocket Two fifty dollar bills. Mine. Let's say somebody gave you a whole stack of these guys, like ten thousand dollars in cash, and they said the only stipulation is you have to deposit this cash in your bank account in the next twenty four hours. The problem is that you cannot physically deposit the money money in your bank. You're not able to do it in person, so you have to fall back on a plan. I have to get someone else to deposit the 10 grand for me. I wonder who you would ask. Are you thinking of somebody right now? Someone that you would ask? Let me take a guess. I'm guessing you're not going to ask some stranger off the street to say, hey, would you take this money and deposit it in my bank account? Here's my account number. You're thinking about someone you trust. You're thinking about someone who is trustworthy, someone who is good, who has proven to keep their word. Am I right? And you have faith in that person because you have gotten to know that person. And as you've gotten to know that person, you have discovered, yeah, I can put my faith in that person. You're saying, where are you going? Okay, here it is. The faith of a Christian is based on the trustworthiness of Jesus Christ. That's it. Our faith is based on the trustworthiness of Jesus Christ. He claimed to be God. He is God. By faith, we say he's God. He said, I am the only way to God the Father. John chapter 14, verse 6. By faith, I say, right, only through Christ. But there is evidence that Jesus is trustworthy. Now, here's the brain part. You know, some of you, you might be in a search mode, or you're not, you know, you're not so sure about things. That's fine. There is evidence that Jesus was an actual person. Uh, there are historical accounts, the New Testament writings. Uh, there are 5,600 biblical manuscripts that all say the same thing about Jesus Christ. If you had the money, you want to take that $10,000 in cash and start going places, you could go to museums, you could go to world universities, and you could start finding these manuscripts, and you can see them for yourselves. And you'll find that some of these manuscripts are just within a few years of the living disciples when they were claiming who Jesus Christ was. 
You could start researching and reading guys like Josephus and other Roman historians in the first, second century, and they declared, yeah, this guy Jesus, he, he really lived. The Bible declares that when Jesus rose from the dead, something that he claimed that he would do, there were over 500 witnesses who were still alive when that claim was made. Early persecutors, crazy early persecutors of the, of the Christians, became followers of Jesus Christ. Something was happening. And Jesus' teachings on love and compassion and righteousness that he modeled and recorded in the, in the scriptures It was lived out by his followers, just generation after generation after generation. Some obscure guy from Nazareth changed the world. The world has been changed. Look at world history, and you'll see how Christianity rose to prominence. Secular textbooks, read them. And you can see the positive impact of Christianity on our world in the area of medicine and science, education, justice, the arts. It's awesome. I was going to go really nerdy on you right now. I, just, I, I deleted this next paragraph. But it sounds like I'm not. Uh, there's a guy who wrote a, a PhD dissertation in the heart of secular America on the impact of Christianity on African nations. And the idea was, oh, man, those missionaries, man, over there, they destroyed the indigenous cultures, and they, they're part of this whole uh, you know, colonial taking over the, the nations and stuff like that. And so Christianity gets a bad rap. But then this guy does his, his uh, dissertation, writes it up, and man, was it thoroughly reviewed. And then he went to these sociological conferences, and it was thoroughly reviewed. Bottom line, the raw data says, nope, you look at, look, you look at those countries where Christianity made an impact, you'll see those missionaries were criticizing those who were trying to impose power on the people. You'll discover that education and health, infant mortality rate, um, all those things improved because of the influence where Christianity took hold. So what's my point? Faith and hope in Jesus Christ is based on evidence. When you get to know the person and you see the impact of the person, it builds your faith. Now next week I'm going to talk about how your faith grows and how it's lived out in very practical and exciting ways. But my remaining time, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 2, that Jesus is the author and perfecter. He is the one who initiates and perfects our faith. And so I want to answer two basic questions about faith as we get this thing going. Number one, question number one is, where does faith come from? And then the second question will be, how do I get it? I mean, man, if faith gives hope, if faith gives confidence and assurance and endurance and it fuels hope and and it fills me with love, I want it. So where does it come from? Let me just read uh, something to you. I I told the guys, don't don't put the slide up. Just just listen to it. Would you just kind of close your eyes maybe if you want to? And I want to read some verses from Ephesians chapter 2. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He's the spirit at work at the, in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By, the, by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God, is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that we are saved. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for all the good things that we've done. No. So none of us can boast about it. What, where does faith come from? The Bible says that faith is a gift from God. It's a gift. By grace you have been saved through faith. It's a gift of God. 
Bible says. You know, you have faith. Everybody's born with the ability to have faith. You're sitting there in those chairs. You're putting faith that it's going to hold you up. You're putting your faith in something. And where we put, your, where we put our faith really matters. You are born with the spiritual ability to exercise faith. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says that because of the curse of sin, you are born where your faith component or ability within you has been damaged. The Bible says that um, your heart or your faith component is is unused, it's asleep, for all practical purposes, dead. You don't have any kind of sensitivity to God because you were born in sin. And that's a curse that every person that we know, everybody on this planet is born into, a proclivity to sin against God's holy laws because they are dead in their, in their sins. And so the Bible says that all people are spiritually dead. They're unresponsive to God. And I see this all the time. They're like, people, you're like, someone's talking about someone they know, and they're not a Christian yet. And they're like, I don't understand why they do it. I don't understand why they do it. Can't they see? Can't they see? The Bible says no. They can't. They cannot see. You can see it, but they cannot see it. And so the Bible says in Ephesians 2, verse 1 and 2, that once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, it says, but God is rich in his mercy and he loved us so much that even though you were dead because of your sins, he gave us life. Highlight that. Underline it. Write it down. God gave us life. Faith. What God does, we call regeneration. The Bible says that your spiritual nature is dead, no pulse, flatline. Now, if that were to happen in an emergency room, the emergency workers would run and bring something in called a crash cart. And they have this thing called a defibrillator. And they pull that sucker out, they get these paddles, and they're... The only thing I know about is the movies. But they, they're doing stuff like this, you know, they're like, drip, uh, clear. <laughs> And the defibrillator seeks to pump life into a heart that has stopped. The Bible says that when you're born, your spiritual heart is already dead. Now, there's other theological things that I can jump into, but I don't want to kill you with too much footnoting right now. But the bottom line is the Bible says that we're dead in our sins. And so God brings his crash cart in by his grace And he hooks you up to the divine defibrillator called the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit paddles. And God regenerates your dead heart to active life. You are regenerated. And now your spiritual senses can can begin to function. Before there was a deadness to God, there was just no response his law, his ways, trying to please God. I was just like, what? What's that all about? Now there's a sensitivity. Now there's awareness. Now this stuff starts becoming important. And you talk to a a, a flourishing Christ follower, and they'll tell you a before and after story. They'll say, "This this was what my life was before I came to know who Jesus Christ and his claims were. And then this is my life after I received him into my life by uh, admitting my sins and believing that he died and rose from the dead um, in power, and he invites to forgive my sins and lead my life. And so there's that before and after. But at that moment in that before and after where the, the change happens, it seems like every time there's a story where it's saying, you know, before I made a decision, something started happening in me. Something in life was happening. I, I had a conversation with somebody. Someone dragged me into church or, you know, something like that where I began to hear the word of God. I began to hear about who God was and, and something began to, to make sense to me. And I was just kind of like drawn towards it. 
the work of God. Pray that way for your friends that do not know the Lord yet. Ask for God to draw them, to open their eyes. Charles Wesley, a, a hymn writer from the 1700s, awesome artist, powerful lyrics. In the song, And Can It Be That I Should Gain, verse 4 tells about kind of like what happened to him. He said this, Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray, and I woke, and the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free, and I rose, and I went, and I followed thee. It's a story of the work of the Spirit regenerating a dead heart. It's beautiful. Am I the only one that's got tingles right now? And so faith is given to awaken you to the power and the grace of God. It is a gift. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5, just a phrase that's important, that um, in the King James, your faith should not stand on the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, which I read just a little bit ago, let's do the King James again. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Where does faith come from? Listen, you didn't, you didn't think it up. It's not something that you manufacture. Trust me. You cannot manufacture faith. And that's the problem. I see a lot of people, man, they're just, they think that's, that's what faith is all about. It's miserable. No, it's a gift. It's a gift from God. So how do I get it? How do I get faith? Ask God for help to get past whatever your belief barrier may be. Romans chapter 9, or excuse me, Mark chapter 9 describes an event when Jesus came upon a crowd that was in commotion. And at the center of that crowd was a demon-possessed boy and a desperate dad trying to find help for his son, And when the boy was brought to Jesus, the demon, the Bible says, threw the boy on the ground in a violent convulsion. And so Jesus, like a physician, asked a couple um, data-gathering questions like, okay, how long has this happened? You know, that kind of stuff. But then, as the father was answering Jesus' inquiry, he said this, have mercy on us and help us if you can. I can almost see Jesus' eyebrow going up in the scriptures. It's like, if I can, moi? No. He didn't do it that way. It's like Jesus is saying, if I can, whoa, anything's possible for the person who believes. And then the dad replies with this classic, classic line in Mark 9, verse 24. He says, I do believe, but help me overcome My unbelief. You catch that? The guy had faith, but he had a faith barrier. So he believed, but then he had something that was blocking that belief. He had a breakthrough. He had to have a breakthrough. And I wonder, if you're here today or if you're listening right now online, that uh, you can relate to that dad when he just said, Lord, I believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. You know, maybe one time in your life, you had, you had faith. And if someone said, you know, does God exist? You know, talk about the Lord Jesus Christ and all that stuff. You'd be like, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you were just pulsating with faith. God is so real to you. I mean, no one could change your mind about who God was and what he had done in your life. Or maybe you're here today and you're you're stuck. You've been stuck for a while. There's some kind of barrier in your life. I'm so glad we can talk about this because this is very normal. It happens. It's It's the way God works. And you you go a certain way, and then there's gonna be a belief barrier. 
read about Jesus and how he did with his own disciples. He, he would bring them to a place where he would, they would have their barrier, and he would press in on that to help them. So what do you do when you're facing some kind of a belief barrier? And you know what you're ha- what, what's going on right now. This should not be normal. This isn't something that you want to do long term. Well, I do. Well, ask the Lord for help, just like the dad. Ask the Lord Jesus to help you with your next step. It's a relationship. Just like that desperate dad, be open and honest with Jesus and just start talking to him about what's going on and ask him, help me. I don't want to be like this. Help me to trust you. Friend, Jesus knows what to do. He's highly competent. (laughs) And he knows exactly how to help you. Because before your life ever existed, he knew you. And the Bible says that he has ordered your days. And he knew this season was going to come. Who cares about whose fault it is or whatever? Let's get the thing fixed. Talk to Jesus about it. He's only a prayer away. A lot of religious activity, very little praying is done in the life of a Christian. In fact, that story of Jesus, uh, once Jesus healed the boy, and the disciples kind of huddled up and said, man, what happened? We were like trying to get this demon out, and we couldn't do it. And Jesus said, this kind, this kind can only come out through prayer. How's your prayer life? Do you have faith that you don't pray? Prayer is so wonderful. It's a gift. It's a privilege. As we're going to see in the upcoming weeks, uh, your confidence will never be nor should ever be in your own faith. This whole idea of faith navel-gazing, you know, that's not what it's all about. Your confidence and your assurance and the endurance to push through trials and other barriers and that sort of thing will be in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your faith is in someone who's trustworthy, and you can ask him for help. Whatever you're facing, he has a vested interest in you. He bled, he died for you. And as you talk to him, and as you're open, as you begin to face whatever it is that you're facing, you're you're concerned about this, or you have no idea what to do about that, whatever it might be, he will answer you. And as he answers you, and you begin to see how he begins to work things out, you're going to have an experience with him. And not only is your mind engaged, but now your experience is engaged. And you're discovering, wow, he is trustworthy. And because your faith is not based on however you're feeling or, you know, how hard you can get that pump going and super inflate the tire and all that kind of stuff, No, man, your faith is in the power and the stability and the trustworthiness of Almighty God. You don't have to work for faith. It's a gift. You don't have to figure out faith like it's some kind of crazy, you know, like you're trying to decode something. No, you can rest in God and his power and his stability. You don't have to have this What's the matter with me? What's the matter with me? What's the matter with me modes? All this self-condemnation. You can find comfort as you look to Jesus because he is good. He is trustworthy. He is powerful. You know, he, he not only can be the guy you can give the 10K to, you can trust him with everything. And maybe you're here this morning, you realize, you know, I, th- I, I, thought I, I thought I was walking in faith in this matter, but I don't think I've really given 100% of this to him. 
that's okay. That's probably why I brought you here today to say, let's get the rest. Let's finish it up. And he will work. He will work in your life. I promise you. And as a result, because of who he is and what he has done and what he promised to do, I can be thankful and I can worship God with an open heart because I have hope again. And because I have this hope reborn, I can move forward in love. And that's what we need. We all need love. And so in our service, we, we purposely create time and space. A lot, some churches, they sing all their songs up front, and, and the guy gets up there and preaches and then closes and everyone goes out. We believe worship is a response to who God is. And it's a response to his revealing himself to us. And we believe that he, re he reveals himself through the word proclaimed. And so that's why we put a lot of our songs at the end, because we want to create space and a chance to process and a time to pray so that you have enough time to deal with whatever it is that you're dealing with. And by the way, when we say goodbye and have a good week, there is no sin. It's not a crime to stay in your seat and not leave until you have peace or you can go to the altar, or you can go to the prayer room. Oh, man, it, it would kill us if, if we did not help you and give you space for God to work in your life. So just remember that, please. But I'm going to pray, and uh, we're going to give you a chance to just talk and be open and honest with God about anything that's going on in your life. I think that's everything. And so I invite you to just close your eyes. And uh, I want to pray for you. And uh, I can't beat a prayer that's exactly in this vein that was prayed by Jude. So Lord, all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. All glory and majesty and power and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Amen.